Typewriter A typewriter is a mechanical or electromechanical machine for writing in characters similar to those produced by printers type by means of keyboard-operated type striking a ribbon to transfer ink or carbon impressions onto the paper. Typically one character is printed per key press. The machine prints characters by making ink impressions of type elements similar to the sorts used in movable type letterpress printing. After their invention in the 1860s, typewriters quickly became indispensable tools for practically all writing other than personal correspondence. They were widely used by professional writers, in offices, and for business correspondence in private homes. By the end of the 1980s, word processors and personal computers had largely displaced typewriters in most of these uses in the Western world, but as of the 2010s the typewriter is still prominent in many parts of the world including India. Notable typewriter manufacturer companies have included E. Remington & Sons, IBM, Imperial Typewriters, Oliver Typewriter Company, Olivetti, Royal Typewriter Company, Smith Corona, Underwood Typewriter Company, Adler and Olympia Worker, De. History Although many modern typewriters have one of several similar designs, their invention was incremental, provided by numerous inventors working independently or in competition with each other over a series of decades. As with the automobile, telephone, and telegraph, a number of people contributed insights and inventions that eventually resulted in ever more commercially successful instruments. In fact, historians have estimated that some form of typewriter was invented 52 times as thinkers tried to come up with a workable design. Early Innovations In 1575 an Italian printmaker, Francesco Rampazzetto, invented the scrittura de teal, a machine to impress letters in papers. In 1714, Henry Mill obtained a patent in Britain for a machine that, from the patent, appears to have been similar to a typewriter. The patent shows that this machine was actually created, have by his great study and pains and expense invented and brought to perfection an artificial machine or method for impressing or transcribing of letters, one after another, as in writing, whereby all writing whatsoever may be engrossed in paper or parchment so neat and exact as not to be distinguished from print. That the said machine or method may be of great use in settlements and public records, the impression being deeper and more lasting than any other writing, and not to be erased or counterfeited without manifest discovery. In 1802 Italian Agostino Fantini developed a particular typewriter to enable his blind sister to write. In 1808 Italian Pellegrino Turri invented a typewriter. He also invented carbon paper to provide the ink for his machine. In 1823 Italian Pietro Conti di Silvana invented a new model of typewriter, the Tachigrafo, also known as Tachitipo. In 1829, William Austin Burt patented a machine called the Typographer, which, in common with many other early machines, is listed as the first typewriter. The Science Museum, London, describes it merely as the first writing mechanism whose invention was documented, but even that claim may be excessive since Turi's invention predates it. Even in the hands of its inventor, this machine was slower than handwriting. Burt and his promoter John D. Sheldon never found a buyer for the patent, so the invention was never commercially produced. Because the typographer used a dial, rather than keys, to select each character, it was called an index typewriter rather than a keyboard typewriter. Index typewriters of that era resemble the squeeze-style embosser from the 1970s more than they resemble the modern keyboard typewriter. By the mid-19th century, the increasing pace of business communication had created a need for mechanization of the writing process. Stenographers and telegraphers could take down information at rates up to 130 words per minute, whereas a writer with a pen was limited to a maximum of 30 words per minute the 1853 speed record. From 1829 to 1870, many printing or typing machines were patented by inventors in Europe and America, but none went into commercial production. Charles Thurber developed multiple patents, of which his first in 1843 was developed as an aid to the blind, such as the 1845 chirographer. In 1855, 
the Italian Giuseppe Revisa created a prototype typewriter called Sembalo Scrivano o Macchina da Scrivere Tasty, Scribe Harpsichord, or Machine for Writing with Keys. It was an advanced machine that let the user see the writing as it was typed. In 1861, Father Francisco Joy de Atzvedo, a Brazilian priest, made his own typewriter with basic materials and tools, such as wood and knives. In that same year the Brazilian Emperor Di Pedro II, presented the gold medal to Father Atzvedo for this invention. Many Brazilian people as well as the Brazilian federal government recognize F.R. Atzvedo is the real inventor of the typewriter, a claim that has been the subject of some controversy. In 1865, John Pratt, of Center, Alabama, built a machine called the Tarotype which appeared in an 1867 Scientific American article and inspired other inventors. Between 1864 and 1867 Peter Mitterhofer, de, a carpenter from South Tyrol, former part of Austria, developed several models and a fully functioning prototype typewriter in 1867. Hansen Writing Ball In 1865, Reverend Rasmus Morling Hansen of Denmark invented the Hansen writing ball, which went into commercial production in 1870 and was the first commercially sold typewriter. It was a success in Europe and was reported as being used in offices in London as late as 1909. Morling Hansen used a solenoid escape munt to return the carriage on some of his models which makes him a candidate for the title of inventor of the first electric typewriter. According to the book H. V. E. M. Scrivacuglenza Finder. English, who is the inventor of the writing ball? Written by Morling Hansen's daughter, Johann A. Jeskov, in 1865, Morling Hansen made a porcelain model of the keyboard of his writing ball and experimented with different placements of the letters to achieve the fastest writing speed. Morling Hansen placed the letters on short pistons that went directly through the ball and down to the paper. This together with the placement of the letters so that the fastest writing fingers struck the most frequently used letters, made the Hansen writing ball the first typewriter to produce text substantially faster than a person could write by hand. The Hansen writing ball was produced with only uppercase characters. Morling Hansen developed his typewriter further through the 1870s and 1880s and made many improvements, but the writing had remained the same. On the first model of the writing ball from 1870, the paper was attached to a cylinder inside a wooden box. In 1874, the cylinder was replaced by a carriage, moving beneath the writing head. Then, in 1875, the well-known tall model was patented, which was the first of the writing balls that worked without electricity. Morling Hansen attended the World Exhibitions in Vienna in 1873 and Paris in 1878 and he received the first prize for his invention at both exhibitions. Scholes and Glidden Typewriter The first typewriter to be commercially successful was invented in 1868 by Americans Christopher Latham Scholes, Carlos Glidden and Samuel W. Sowell in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, although Scholes soon disowned the machine and refused to use or even to recommend it. The working prototype was made by the machinist Matthias Schwalbach. The patent, US 79265 was sold for $12,000 to Densmore and Yost, who made an agreement with E. Remington and Sons, then famous as a manufacturer of sewing machines, to commercialize the machine as the Scholes and Glidden typewriter. This was the origin of the term typewriter. Remington began production of its first typewriter on March 1, 1873, in Eileen, New York. It had a QWERTY keyboard layout, which because of the machine's success, was slowly adopted by other typewriter manufacturers. As with most other early typewriters, because the type bars strike upwards, the typist could not see the characters as they were typed. Standardization by about 1910, the manual, or mechanical typewriter had reached a somewhat standardized design. There were minor variations from one manufacturer to another, but most typewriters followed the concept that each key was attached to a tip bar that had the corresponding letter molded, in reverse, into its striking head. When a key was struck briskly and firmly, the tip bar hit a ribbon, usually made of inked fabric, 
making a printed mark on the paper wrapped around a cylindrical plate. The plate was mounted on a carriage that moved left or right, automatically advancing the typing position horizontally after each character was typed. The paper, rolled around the typewriter's plate, was then advanced vertically by the carriage return lever, at the far left, or sometimes on the far right, into position for each new line of text. Some ribbons were inked in black and red stripes, each being half the width and the entire length of the ribbon. A lever on most machines allowed switching between colors, which was useful for bookkeeping entries where negative amounts had to be in red. Front striking. In most of the early typewriters, the type bars struck upward against the paper, pressed against the bottom of the plate, and so the typist could not see the text as it was typed. What was typed was not visible until a carriage return caused it to scroll into view. The difficulty with any other arrangement was ensuring the type bars fell back into place reliably when the key was released. This was eventually achieved with various ingenious mechanical designs and so called visible typewriters which used front striking, in which the type bars struck forward against the front side of the plate and became standard. One of the first was the Doughty Visible, introduced in 1893, which also introduced the four-bank keyboard that became standard, although the Underwood which came out two years later was the first major typewriter with these features. However, older non-visible models continued in production to as late as 1915. Shift key. A significant innovation was the shift key, introduced with the Remington No. 2 in 1878. This key physically shifted, either the basket of tip bars, in which case the typewriter is described as basket shift, or the paper holding carriage, in which case the typewriter is described as carriage shift. Either mechanism caused a different portion of the tip bar to come in contact with the ribbon plate. The result is that each tip bar could type two different characters, cutting the number of keys and tip bars in half, and simplifying the internal mechanisms considerably. The obvious use for this was to allow letter keys to type both upper and lower case, but normally the number keys were also duplexed, allowing access to special symbols such as percent, percent and ampersand, and. With the shift key, manufacturing costs, and therefore purchase price, were greatly reduced, and typist operation was simplified. Both factors contributed greatly to mass adoption of the technology. Certain models, such as the Barlet, had a double shift so that each key performed three functions. These little three-row machines were very portable and could be used by journalists, etc. However, because the shift key required more force to push, its mechanism was moving a much larger mass than other keys, and was operated by the pinky finger, normally the weakest finger on the hand, it was difficult to hold the shift down for more than two or three consecutive strokes. The shift lock key, the precursor to the modern caps lock, allowed the shift operation to be maintained indefinitely. Character sizes In English-speaking countries, the commonplace typewriter's printing fixed-width characters were standardized to print six horizontal lines per vertical inch, and had either of two variants of character width called Pica for 10 characters per horizontal inch and Elite for 12. This differs from the use of these terms in printing, where they refer to the height of the characters on the page, Pica making for 10 horizontal lines per vertical inch. Noiseless designs In the early part of the 20th century, the typewriter was marketed under the name Noiseless, and advertised as silent. It was developed by Wellington Parker Kidder and the first model was marketed by the Noiseless Typewriter Company in 1917. An agreement with Remington in 1924 saw production transferred to Remington, and a further agreement in 1929 allowed Underwood to produce it as well. It failed to sell well, leading some observers to the conclusion that the clickety-clack of the typical typewriter was a consumer preference. A more likely reason is that the claims of silent operation were simply untrue. In a conventional typewriter the type bars are decelerated at the end of their travel simply by impacting upon the ribbon and paper. So-called noiseless typewriters have a complex lever mechanism that decelerates the tip bar mechanically and then presses it against the ribbon and paper in an attempt to render the process less noisy. 
it was not particularly successful. It certainly reduced the high frequency content of the sound, rendering it more of a clunk than a clack, and arguably less intrusive, but the grandiose claims of the advertising, such as a machine that can be operated a few feet away from your desk, and not be heard, were entirely without foundation. Electric Designs Although electric typewriters would not achieve widespread popularity until nearly a century later, the basic groundwork for the electric typewriter was laid by the universal stock ticker, invented by Thomas Edison in 1870. This device remotely printed letters and numbers on a stream of paper tape from input generated by a specially designed typewriter at the other end of a telegraph line. Early Electric Models the first electric typewriter was produced by the Blick & Sturfer Manufacturing Company, of Stamford, Connecticut, in 1902. Like the manual Blick & Sturfer typewriters it used a cylindrical type wheel rather than individual tip bars. It was not a commercial success, which may have been because at the time electricity had not been standardized and voltage differed from city to city. The next step in the development of the electric typewriter came in 1910 when Charles and Howard Crumb filed a patent for the first practical teletypewriter. The Crumbs machine, named the Morecrum Printing Telegraph, used a type wheel rather than individual tip bars. This machine was used for the first commercial teletypewriter system on postal telegraph company lines between Boston and New York City in 1910. James Fields Smathers of Kansas City invented what is considered the first practical power-operated typewriter in 1914. In 1920, after returning from army service, he produced a successful model and in 1923 turned it over to the Northeast Electric Company of Rochester for development. Northeast was interested in finding new markets for their electric motors and developed Smathers's design so that it could be marketed to typewriter manufacturers, and from 1925 Remington electric typewriters were produced powered by Northeast's motors. After some 2,500 electric typewriters had been produced, Northeast asked Remington for a firm contract for the next batch. However, Remington was engaged in merger talks which would eventually result in the creation of Remington Rand and no executives were willing to commit to a firm order. Northeast instead decided to enter the typewriter business for itself, and in 1929 produced the first electromatic typewriter. In 1928, Delco, a division of General Motors, purchased Northeast Electric, and the typewriter business was spun off as the Electromatic Typewriters, Incorporated. In 1933, Electromatic was acquired by IBM, which then spent $1 million on a redesign of the Electromatic Typewriter, launching the IBM Electric Typewriter Model 01 in 1935. By 1958 IBM was deriving 8% of its revenue from the sale of electric typewriters. In 1931, an electric typewriter was introduced by Varitiper Corporation. It was called the Varitiper, because a narrow cylinder-like wheel could be replaced to change the font. Electrical typewriter designs removed the direct mechanical connection between the keys and the element that struck the paper. Not to be confused with later electronic typewriters, electric typewriters contained only a single electrical component, the motor. Where the keystroke had previously moved a tip bar directly, now it engaged mechanical linkages that directed mechanical power from the motor into the tip bar. In 1941, IBM announced the Electromatic Model 04 electric typewriter, featuring the revolutionary concept of proportional spacing. By assigning varied rather than uniform spacing to different sized characters, the Type 4 recreated the appearance of a printed page an effect that was further enhanced by a typewriter ribbon innovation that produced clearer, sharper words on the page. The proportional spacing feature became a staple of the IBM Executive Series typewriters. IBM Selectric IBM and Remington Rand Electric typewriters were the leading models until IBM introduced the IBM Selectric typewriter in 1961, which replaced the tip bars with a spherical element, or tip ball, slightly smaller than a golf ball, with reverse image letters molded into its surface. This electric used a system of latches, metal tapes, 
and pulleys driven by an electric motor to rotate the ball into the correct position and then strike it against the ribbon and plate. The tip ball moved laterally in front of the paper, instead of the previous designs using a plate and carrying carriage moving the paper across a stationary print position. Due to the physical similarity, the tip ball was sometimes referred to as a golf ball. The tip ball design had many advantages, especially the elimination of jams, when more than one key was struck at once and the tip bars became entangled, and in the ability to change the tip ball, allowing multiple fonts to be used in a single document. The IBM Selectric became a commercial success, dominating the office typewriter market for at least two decades. IBM also gained an advantage by marketing more heavily to schools than did Remington, with the idea that students who learned to type on a Selectric would later choose IBM typewriters over the competition in the workplace as businesses replaced their old manual models. By the 1970s, IBM had succeeded in establishing the Selectric as the de facto standard typewriter in mid to high end office environments, replacing the raucous clack of older tip bar machines with the quieter sound of gyrating tip balls. Later models of IBM executives and Selectrics replaced inked fabric ribbons with carbon film ribbons that had a dry black or colored powder on a clear plastic tape. These could be used only once, but later models used a cartridge that was simple to replace. A side effect of this technology was that the text typed on the machine could be easily read from the used ribbon, raising issues where the machines were used for preparing classified documents, ribbons had to be accounted for to ensure that typists did not carry them from the facility. A variation known as correcting selectrics introduced a correction feature, where a sticky tape in front of the carbon film ribbon could remove the black powdered image of a typed character eliminating the need for little bottles of white dab on correction fluid and for hard erasers that could tear the paper. These machines also introduced selectable pitch so that the typewriter could be switched between Piker type, 10 characters per inch, and Elite type, 12 per inch, even within one document. Even so, all Selectrics were monospaced, each character and letter space was allotted the same width on the page, from a capital W to a period. Although IBM had produced a successful tip bar based machine with five levels of proportional spacing, called the IBM Executive, proportional spacing was not provided with the Selectric typewriter or its successors, the Selectric 2 and Selectric 3. The only fully electromechanical Selectric typewriter with fully proportional spacing and which used a Selectric type element was the expensive Selectric Composer which was capable of right margin justification and was considered a typesetting machine rather than a typewriter. In addition to its electronic successes, the Magnetic Tape Selectric Composer, MTSC, the MagCard Selectric Composer, and the Electronic Selectric Composer, IBM also made electronic typewriters with proportional spacing using the Selectric element that were considered typewriters or word processors instead of typesetting machines. The first of these was the relatively obscure MagCard Executive, which used 88 character elements. Later, some of the same type styles used for it were used on the 96 character elements used on the IBM Electronic Typewriter 50 and the later models 65 and 85. By 1970, as offset printing began to replace letterpress printing, the composer would be adapted as the output unit for a typesetting system. The system included a computer-driven input station to capture the keystrokes on magnetic tape and insert the operator's format commands, and a composer unit to read the tape and produce the formatted text for photo reproduction. Selectric mechanisms were widely incorporated into computer terminals in the 1960s and 1970s, as they possessed obvious advantages. Reasonably fast, jam-free, and reliable, relatively quiet and more importantly, free of major vibrations, could produce high-quality lower and upper case output, compared to competitors such as teletype machines, could be activated by a short, low-force mechanical action, allowing easier interfacing to electronic controls, did not require the movement of a heavy type basket to shift between lower and upper case, allowing higher speed without heavy impacts, did not require the plate and roller assembly to move from side to side a problem with continuous feed paper used for automated printing.
The IBM 2741 terminal was a popular example of a Selectric-based computer terminal, and similar mechanisms were employed as the console devices for many IBM System 360 computers. These mechanisms used ruggedized designs compared to those in standard office typewriters. Later electric models Some of IBM's advances were later adopted in less expensive machines from competitors. For example, Smith Corona electric typewriters of the 1970s used interchangeable ribbon cartridges, including fabric, film, erasing, and two color versions. At about the same time, the advent of photocopying meant that carbon copies and erasers were less and less necessary. Only the original need be typed, and photocopies made from it. Typewriter printer hybrids Towards the end of the commercial popularity of typewriters in the 1970s, a number of hybrid designs combining features of printers were introduced. These often incorporated keyboards from existing models of typewriters and printing mechanisms of dot matrix printers. The generation of teleprinters with impact pin-based printing engines was not adequate for the demanding quality required for typed output, and alternative thermal transfer technologies used in thermal label printers had become technically feasible for typewriters. IBM produced a series of typewriters called Thermotronic with letter quality output and correcting tape along with printers tagged Keytriter. Brother extended the life of their typewriter product line with similar products. The development of these proprietary printing engines provided the vendors with exclusive markets in consumable ribbons and the ability to use standardized printing engines with varying degrees of electronic and software sophistication to develop product lines. Although these changes reduced prices, and greatly increased the convenience, of typewriters, the technological disruption posed by word processors left these improvements with only a short-term low-end market. To extend the life of these products, many examples were provided with communication ports to connect them to computers as printers. Electronic Typewriters The final major development of the typewriter was the electronic typewriter. Most of these replaced the tip ball with a plastic or metal daisy wheel mechanism, a disc with the letters molded on the outside edge of the petals. The daisy wheel concept first emerged in printers developed by Diablo Systems in the 1970s. In 1981, Xerox Corporation, who by then had bought Diablo Systems, introduced a line of electronic typewriters incorporating this technology, the Memory Writer product line. For a time, these products were quite successful as their plastic daisy wheel was much simpler and cheaper than the metal tip ball and their electronic memory and display allowed the user to easily see errors and correct them before they were actually printed. One problem with the plastic daisy wheel was that they were not always durable. To solve this problem, more durable metal daisy wheels were made available, but at a slightly higher price. These and similar electronic typewriters were in essence dedicated word processors with either single-line LCD displays or multi-line CRT displays, built-in line editors and ROM, a spelling and grammar checker, a few kilobytes of internal RAM and optional cartridge, magnetic card or diskette external memory storage devices for storing text and even document formats. Text could be entered a line or paragraph at a time and edited using the display and built-in software tools before being committed to paper. Unlike the Selectrics and earlier models, these really were electronic, and relied on integrated circuits and multiple electromechanical components. These typewriters were sometimes called display typewriters, dedicated word processors or word processing typewriters though the latter term was also frequently applied to less sophisticated machines that featured only a tiny, sometimes just single-row display. Sophisticated models were also called word processors, though today that term almost always denotes a type of software program. Manufacturers of such machines included Brother, Brother WP-1 and WP-500 etc., where WP stood for Word Processor, Canon, Canon Cat, Smith Corona, PWP, that is Personal Word Processor Line, and Philips Magnavox, Video Writer. End of an Era The 1970s and early 1980s were a time of transition for typewriters and word processors. 
At one point in time, most small business offices would be completely old style, while large corporations and government departments would already be all new style. Other offices would have a mixture. The pace of change was so rapid that it was common for clerical staff to have to learn several new systems, one after the other, in just a few years. While such rapid change is commonplace today, and is taken for granted, this was not always so. In fact, typewriting technology changed very little in its first 80 or 90 years. Due to falling sales, IBM sold its typewriter division in 1990 to Lexmark, completely exiting from a market it once dominated. The increasing dominance of personal computers, desktop publishing, the introduction of low-cost, truly high-quality, laser and inkjet printer technologies, and the pervasive use of web publishing, email and other electronic communication techniques have largely replaced typewriters in the United States. Still, as of 2009, typewriters continued to be used by a number of government agencies and other institutions in the USA, where they are primarily used to fill pre-printed forms. According to a Boston typewriter repairman quoted by the Boston Globe, every maternity wards has a typewriter, as well as funeral homes. A fairly major typewriter user is the city of New York, which in 2008 purchased several thousands typewriters, mostly for use by the New York Police Department, at the total cost of $982,269. Another $99,570 was spent in 2009 for the maintenance of the existing typewriters. New York police officers would use the machines to type property and evidence vouchers on carbon paper forms. A rather specialized market for typewriters exists due to the regulations of many correctional systems in the USA, where prisoners are prohibited to have computers or telecommunication equipment, but are allowed to own typewriters. The Swink Corporation, headquartered in Moonachie, New Jersey, which, as of 2011, still produce typewriters at its overseas factories, in Japan, Indonesia, and or Malaysia, manufactures a variety of typewriters for use in prisons, made of clear plastic, to make it harder for prisoners to hide prohibited items inside it. As of 2011, the company had contracts with prisons in 43 U.S. states. In April 2011, Godridge and Boyce, a Mumbai-based manufacturer of mechanical typewriters, closed its doors, leading to a flurry of erroneous news reports that the world's last typewriter factory had shut down. The reports were quickly debunked. In November 2012, Brothers UK factory manufactured what it claimed to be the last typewriter ever made in the UK. The typewriter was donated to the London Science Museum. Russian typewriters use Cyrillic which has made the ongoing Azerbaijani reconversion from Cyrillic to Roman alphabet more difficult. In 1997, the government of Turkey offered to donate Western typewriters to the Republic of Azerbaijan in exchange for more zealous and exclusive promotion of the Roman alphabet for the Azerbaijani language. This offer, however, was declined. In Latin America and Africa, mechanical typewriters are still common because they can be used without electrical power. In Latin America, the typewriters used are most often Brazilian models. Brazil continues to produce mechanical, facet, and electronic, Olivetti, typewriters to the present day. Correction Technologies According to the standards taught in secretarial schools in the mid 20th century, a business letter was supposed to have no mistakes and no visible corrections. Accuracy was prized as much as speed. Indeed, Typing speeds, as scored in proficiency tests and typewriting speed competitions, included a deduction of 10 words for every mistake. Corrections were, of course, necessary, and many methods were developed. In practice, several methods would often be combined. For example, if six extra copies of a letter were needed, the fluid corrected original would be photocopied, but only for the two recipients getting CC. S. The other four copies, the less important file copies that stayed in various departments at the office, would be cheaper, hand erased, less distinct bond paper copies or even flimsies of different colors, tissue papers interleaved with black carbon paper, 
that were all typed as a carbon pack at the same time as the original. Typewriter erasers The traditional erasing method involved the use of a special typewriter eraser made of hard rubber that contained an abrasive material. Some were thin, flat discs, pink or gray, approximately 2 inches, 51 millimeters, in diameter by 1 slash 8 inch, 3.2 millimeters, thick, with a brush attached from the center, while others looked like pink pencils with a sharpenable eraser at the lead end and a stiff nylon brush at the other end. Either way, these tools made possible erasure of individual typed letters. Business letters were typed on heavyweight, high rag content bond paper, not merely to provide a luxurious appearance, but also to stand up to erasure. Typewriter eraser brushes were necessary for clearing eraser crumbs and paper dust, and using the brush properly was an important element of typewriting skill. If a razor detritus fell into the typewriter, a small buildup could cause the tip bars to jam in their narrow supporting grooves. Eraser Shield Erasing a set of carbon copies was particularly difficult, and called for the use of a device called an eraser shield, a thin stainless steel rectangle about 2 by 3 inches, 51 by 76 millimeters, with several tiny holes in it to prevent the pressure of erasing on the upper copies from producing carbon smudges on the lower copies. To correct copies, typists had to go from carbon copy to carbon copy, trying not to get their fingers dirty as they leafed through the carbon papers, and moving and repositioning the eraser shield and eraser for each copy. Erasable Bond Paper companies produced a special form of typewriter paper called Erasable Bond, for example, Eaton's Corazable Bond. This incorporated a thin layer of material that prevented ink from penetrating and was relatively soft and easy to remove from the page. An ordinary soft pencil eraser could quickly produce perfect erasures on this kind of paper. However, the same characteristics that made the paper erasable made the characters subject to smudging due to ordinary friction and deliberate alteration after the fact, making it unacceptable for business correspondence, contracts or any archival use. Correction Fluid In the 1950s and 1960s, correction fluid made its appearance, under brand names such as Liquid Paper, White Out and Tipex. It was invented by Bet Nesmith Graham. Correction fluid was a kind of opaque, white, fast-drying paint that produced a fresh white surface onto which, when dry, a correction could be retyped. However, when held to the light, the covered-up characters were visible, as was the patch of dry correction fluid, which was never perfectly flat, and never a perfect match for the color, texture, and luster of the surrounding paper. The standard trick for solving this problem was photocopying the corrected page, but this was possible only with high-quality photocopiers. Not surprisingly, given the demand, photocopier quality improved quickly. Dry correction Dry correction products, such as correction paper, under brand names such as Correctype were introduced in the 1970s and functioned like white carbon paper. A strip of the product was placed over the letters needing correction, and the incorrect letters were retyped, causing the black character to be overstruck with a white overcoat. Similar material was soon incorporated in carbon film electric typewriter ribbons. Like the traditional two-color black and red ink ribbon common on manual typewriters, a black and white correcting ribbon became commonplace on electric typewriters. But the black or white coating could be partly rubbed off with handling, so such corrections were generally not acceptable in legal documents. The pinnacle of this kind of technology was the IBM Electronic Typewriter Series. These machines, and similar products from other manufacturers, used a separate correction ribbon and a character memory. With a single keystroke, the typewriter was capable of automatically backspacing and then overstriking the previous characters with minimal marring of the paper. White cover-up ribbons were used with fabric ink ribbons, or an alternate premium design featured plastic lift-off correction ribbons which were used with carbon film typing ribbons. This latter technology actually lifted the carbon film forming a typed letter, leaving nothing more than a flattened depression in the surface of the paper, with the advantage that no color matching of the paper was needed. 
Legacy Keyboard Layouts QWERTY the 1874 Scholes and Glidden typewriters established the QWERTY layout for the letter keys. During the period in which Scholes and his colleagues were experimenting with this invention, other keyboard arrangements were apparently tried, but these are poorly documented. The QWERTY layout of keys has become the de facto standard for English language typewriter and computer keyboards. Other languages written in the Latin alphabet sometimes use variants of the QWERTY layouts, such as the French AZERTY, the Italian QZERTY and the German KITS layouts. The QWERTY layout is not the most efficient layout possible for the English language, since it requires a touch typist to move his or her fingers between rows to type the most common letters. The most likely explanation for the QWERTY arrangement is that it was designed to reduce the likelihood of internal clashing of tip bars by placing commonly used combinations of letters farther from each other inside the machine. This allowed the user to type faster without jamming. In a mechanical typewriter, the arrangement of tip bars is tied to the arrangement of the keys, and two adjacent bars are much more likely to clash if struck together or in a rapid sequence. Another story is that the QWERTY layout allowed early typewriter salesmen to impress their customers by being able to easily type out the example word typewriter without having learned the full keyboard layout, because typewriter can be spelled purely on the top row of the keyboard. It's also the longest common English word you can type using purely the first row of keys. Some longer English words exist but they are quite uncommon. Other layouts. A number of radically different layouts such as Dvorak have been proposed to reduce the perceived inefficiencies of QWERTY, but none have been able to displace the QWERTY layout. Their proponents claim considerable advantages, but so far none has been widely used. The Blickensturfer typewriter with its diatrance layout may have possibly been the first attempt at optimizing the keyboard layout for efficiency advantages. Many non-Latin alphabets have keyboard layouts that have nothing to do with QWERTY. The Russian layout, for instance, puts the common trigrams of R, PRO, and IT on adjacent keys so that they can be typed by rolling the fingers. The Greek layout, on the other hand, is a variant of QWERTY. Typewriters were also made for East Asian languages with thousands of characters, such as Chinese or Japanese. They were not easy to operate, but professional typists used them for a long time until the development of electronic word processors and laser printers in the 1980s. See the gallery at the end of this article for pictures of East Asian mechanical typewriters. On modern keyboards, the exclamation point is the shifted character on the one key, a direct result of the historical fact that these were the last characters to become standard on keyboards. Holding the spacebar pressed down usually suspended the carriage advance mechanism, a so-called dead key feature, allowing one to superimpose multiple key strikes on a single location. The C slash symbol, meaning sense, was located above the number 6 on electric typewriters, while ASCII computer keyboards have instead. Typewriter conventions a number of typographical conventions originate from the widespread use of the typewriter, based on the characteristics and limitations of the typewriter itself. For example, the QWERTY keyboard typewriter did not include keys for the N- and the M-. To overcome this limitation, users typically typed more than one adjacent hyphen to approximate these symbols. This typewriter convention is still sometimes used today, even though modern computer word processing applications can input the correct N and M dashes for each font type. Other examples of typewriter practices that are sometimes still used in desktop publishing systems include inserting a double space at the end of a sentence, and the use of straight quotes, or dumb quotes as quotation marks and prime marks. The practice of underlining text in place of italics and the use of all capitals to provide emphasis are additional examples of typographical conventions that derived from the limitations of the typewriter keyboard that still carry on today. Many older typewriters did not include a separate key for the numeral one or the exclamation point, 
and some even older ones also lack the numeral zero. Typists who trained on these machines learned the habit of using the lowercase letter L, L for the digit 1, and the uppercase O for the zero. A sense symbol, C slash was created by combining, over striking, a lowercase C with a slash character, typing C, then backspace, then slash. Similarly, the exclamation point was created by combining an apostrophe and a period. These characters were omitted to simplify design and reduce manufacturing and maintenance costs. They were chosen specifically because they were redundant, and could be recreated using other keys. Computer jargon Some terminology from the typewriter age has survived into the personal computer era. Examples include Backspace, BS, a keystroke that moved the cursor backwards one position, on a physical plate and, this is the exact opposite of the space key, for the purpose of overtyping a character. This could be for combining characters, for example an apostrophe, backspace, and period make an exclamation point, a character missing on some early typewriters, or for correction such as with the correcting tape that developed later, carriage return, CR, return to the first column of text and, in some systems, switch to the next line, cursor, a marker used to indicate where the next character will be printed. The cursor, however, was originally a term to describe the clear slider on a slide rule, cut and paste, taking text, a numerical table, or an image and pasting it into a document. The term originated when such compound documents were created using manual paste-up techniques for typographic page layout. Actual brushes and paste were later replaced by hot wax machines equipped with cylinders that applied melted adhesive wax to developed prints of typeset copy. This copy was then cut out with knives and rulers, and slid into position on layout sheets on slanting layout tables. After the copy had been correctly positioned and squared up using a T-square and set square, it was pressed down with a brayer, or roller. The whole point of the exercise was to create so-called camera-ready copy, which existed only to be photographed and then printed, usually by offset lithography. Dead key, describes a key that when typed, does not advance the typing position, thus allowing another character to be overstruck on top of the original character. This typically was used to combine diacritical marks with letters they modified, for example E can be generated by first pressing and then E. The dead key feature was often implemented mechanically by having the typist press and hold the space bar while typing the characters to be superimposed. Line feed, LF, also called new line moving the cursor to the next on-screen line of text in a word processor document. Shift, a modifier key used to type capital letters and other alternate uppercase characters. When pressed and held down, would shift a typewriter's mechanism to allow a different tip bar impression such as D instead of D to press into the ribbon and print on a page. The concept of a shift key or modifier key was later extended to CTRL, Alt, and Super, Windows, or Apple keys on modern computer keyboards. The generalized concept of a shift key reached its apotheosis in the MIT Space Cadet keyboard, Tab, HT, shortened from horizontal tab or tabulator stop caused the print position to advance horizontally to the next preset tab stop. This was used for typing lists and tables with vertical columns of numbers or words. The related term vertical tab, VT, never came into widespread use. TTY, short for teletypewriter, used in Unix-like operating systems to designate a given terminal. In the above listing, the two letter codes in parentheses are abbreviations for the ASCII characters derived from typewriter usage. Early social effects When Remington started marketing typewriters, the company assumed the machine would not be used for composing but for transcribing dictation, and that the person typing would be a woman. The 1800s Shells and Glidden typewriter had floral ornamentation on the case. Women's roles in the world wars, both one and two, put more women into the workforce replacing men. In the United States, women often started in the professional workplace as typists. Questions about morals made a salacious businessman making sexual advances to a female typist into a cliché of office life, appearing in vaudeville and movies. 
the Tijuana Bibles, adult comic books produced in Mexico for the American market, starting in the 1930s, often featured women typists. In one panel, a businessman in a three-piece suit, ogling his secretary's thigh, says, Miss Higby, are you ready for, a hum? Uh, dictation? Authors and writers who had notable relationships with typewriters. Early adopters. Henry James dictated to a typist. Mark Twain claimed in his autobiography that he was the first important writer to present a publisher with a typewritten manuscript, for The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, 1876. Research showed that Twain's memory was incorrect and that the first book submitted in typed form was Life on the Mississippi, 1883, also by Twain. Others William S. Burroughs wrote in some of his novels, and possibly believed, that a machine he called the soft typewriter was writing our lives, and our books, into existence, according to a book review in The New Yorker. And, in the film adaptation of his novel Naked Lunch, his typewriter is a living, insect-like entity, voiced by North American actor Peter Baratsky, and actually dictates the book to him. Writer Zach Hellman director Mark Forster explored the potential mechanics of the soft typewriter philosophy in the movie Stranger Than Fiction, in which the very act of typing up her handwritten notes gives a fiction writer the power to kill or otherwise manipulate her main character in real life. Ernest Hemingway used to write his books standing up in front of a royal typewriter suitably placed on a tall bookshelf. This typewriter, still on its bookshelf, is kept in Finca Vigia. Hemingway's Havana House, now a museum, where he lived until 1960, the year before his death. J. R. Tolkien was likewise accustomed to typing from awkward positions, balancing his typewriter on his attic bed, because there was no room on his desk. In his foreword to The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien stated that the whole story had to be typed, and retyped, by me. The cost of professional typing by the ten fingered was beyond my means. Jack Kerouac, a fast typist at 100 words per minute, typed on the road on a roll of paper so he would not be interrupted by having to change the paper. Within two weeks of starting to write on the road, Kerouac had one single spaced paragraph, 120 feet long. Some scholars say the scroll was shelf paper. Others contend it was a thermo fax roll. Another theory is that the roll consisted of sheets of architect's paper taped together. His rapid work earned the famous rebuke from Truman Capote, that's not writing, it's typing. Another fast typist of the Beat Generation was Richard Brautigan, who said that he thought out the plots of his books in detail beforehand, then typed them out at speeds approaching 90 to 100 words a minute. Tom Robbins waxed philosophical about the Remington SL3, a typewriter that he bought to write still life with Woodpecker. He eventually did away with it because it is too complicated and inhuman for the writing of poetry. After completing the novel Beautiful Losers, Leonard Cohen is said to have flung his typewriter into the Aegean Sea. Don Marquis purposely used the limitations of a typewriter, or more precisely, a particular typist, in his Archie and Mitabel series of newspaper columns, which were later compiled into a series of books. According to his literary conceit, a cockroach named Archie was a reincarnated free verse poet, who would type articles overnight by jumping onto the keys of a manual typewriter. The writings were typed completely in lower case, because of the cockroach's inability to generate the heavy force needed to operate the shift key. The lone exception is the poem Capitals at Last from Archie's Life of Mitabel, written in 1933. Late Users Andy Rooney and William F. Buckley, Jr., 1982, were among many writers who were very reluctant to switch from typewriters to computers. David McCulloch bought himself a second-hand royal typewriter in 1965 and it has been the sole piece of technology in producing the manuscripts of every book this two-time Pulitzer Prize-winning, New York Times best-selling author has published. Hunter S. Thompson kept a typewriter in his kitchen and is believed to have written his Hey, Rube! column for ESPN.com on a typewriter. He used a typewriter until his suicide in 2005. 
Theodore Kaczynski, the Unna Bomber, wrote his manifesto as well as his letters on a manual typewriter. David Starr is used a typewriter to write his essay collections through me talk pretty one day at least. Richard Polt, a philosophy professor at Xavier University in Cincinnati who collects typewriters, edits etc., a quarterly magazine about historic writing machines. William Gibson used a Hermes 2000 model manual typewriter to write Neuromancer and Half of Count Zero before a mechanical failure and lack of replacement parts forced him to upgrade to an Apple Air computer. Harlan Ellison has used typewriters for his entire career, and when he was no longer able to have them repaired, learned to do it himself. He has repeatedly stated his belief that computers are bad for writing, maintaining, art is not supposed to be easier. Author Cormac McCarthy continues to write his novels on an Olivetti Letterer 32 typewriter to the present day. In 2009, the Letterer he obtained from a pawn shop in 1963, on which nearly all his novels and screenplays have been written, was auctioned for charity at Christie's for $254,500 USD. McCarthy obtained an identical replacement for $20 to continue writing on. Will self explains why he uses a manual typewriter, I think the computer user does their thinking on the screen, and the non-computer user is compelled, because he or she is to retype a whole text, to do a lot more thinking in the head. Typewriters in popular culture In music The composer Pablo Sarozabal includes in a scene of his Zarzula Loterna Canción, 1945, a typewriter. Accompanied by an orchestra and vocal soloists, the scene is in a police station, where a policeman is deposing witnesses, and is singing while he types the report. The composer Leroy Anderson wrote the typewriter, 1950, for orchestra and typewriter, and it has since been used as the theme for numerous radio programs. The solo instrument is a real typewriter played by a percussionist. The piece was later made famous by comedian Jerry Lewis as part of his regular routine both on screen and stage, most notably in the 1963 film Who's Minding the Store? Pink Floyd used a typewriter, complete with carriage return bell, as a percussion instrument on their song Money, 1973. A typewriter provides the percussive backing for stereo totals Dactylo Rock the first song from their debut album, 1995. An Estonian prog rock band and Speth features typewriters as a rhythmic instruments in their album Typewriter Concerto in D Major, 1994. A suite of songs entitled Green Typewriters is on the Olivia Tremor Controls album Dusk at Cubist Castle, 1996, and the sounds of typewriters can be heard in a few of the sections. American singer songwriter Marion Call accompanies herself on a typewriter on Nerd Anthem, c. 1998. American musician Beck's 2005 music video for Black Tambourine features typewriter characters to animate Beck's moving and playing guitar. The title track of Hint's 2006 album Locked in a Basement prominently features the typewriter as a percussion instrument. The Boston Typewriter Orchestra, BTO, has performed at numerous art festivals, clubs, and parties since at least 2008. The group consists of a half dozen performers who use typewriters as percussive musical instruments. Under the slogan, The Revolution Will Be Typewritten, South Korean improviser Ryohan Kiel frequently performs typewriters, most prominently in his 2009 album Becoming Typewriter. Lead singer songwriter Eddie Vedder of Pearl Jam types many of the band's lyrics on vintage typewriters. Other in the film The History of the Typewriter recited by Michael Winslow, voice sound effect performer Michael Winslow recreates the sounds of 32 typewriters from history. The word typewriter is often cited as the longest English word that can be typed using only one row of keys of a QWE or TY keyboard. This is untrue, since Ruptuart, a kind of flowering plant, has 11 letters, while typewriter has only 10. Taber's Cyclopedic Medical Dictionary defines Erawairita, 12 letters, a sentence which uses every letter of the alphabet, a pangram, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog can be used to check typewriters quickly. The early Resident Evil video games used a typewriter as the save feature, and used one ink ribbon per save. 
The opening title sequence of Murder She Wrote prominently features Jessica Fletcher touch typing a manuscript with a 1940s style royal typewriter. Although in one episode Fletcher rejects a character's offer to sell her a computer to replace the old royal, which he calls a dinosaur, towards the series' end, she too begins using a computer and word processing typewriter. In Rome, the Alta della Patria, national monument to Victor Emmanuel II, used to be nicknamed the typewriter, because of his strange shape and popular dislike. The 2012 French comedy movie Populaire starring Romain Duris and Deborah Francois centers around a young secretary in the 1950s striving to win typewriting speed competitions. 2012 AU Education Research claimed that proper typing position and distance to the screen are the main factors of typing faster. Forensic Examination Typewritten documents may be examined by forensic document examiners. This is done primarily to determine 1, the make and or model of the typewriter used to produce a document, or 2, whether or not a particular suspect typewriter might have been used to produce a document. In some situations, an ink or correction ribbon may also be examined. The determination of a make and or model of typewriter is a classification problem and several systems have been developed for this purpose. These include the original Haas typewriter atlases, Pica version, and, non pica version, and the type system developed by Dr. Philippe Buford, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police's Dematrix typewriter classification system, and the Interpol's typewriter classification system, among others. Because of the tolerances of the mechanical parts, slight variation in the alignment of the letters and their uneven wear, each typewriter has an individual signature, or fingerprint, which may permit a typewritten document to be traced back to the typewriter on which it was produced. For devices utilizing replaceable components, such as a tip ball element, any association may be restricted to a specific element, rather than to the typewriter as a whole. The earliest reference in fictional literature to the potential identification of a typewriter as having produced a document was by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle who wrote A Case of Identity in 1891. In non-fiction, the first document examiner to describe how a typewriter might be identified was William E. Hagen who wrote, in 1894, all typewriter machines, even when using the same kind of type, become more or less peculiar by use as to the work done by them. Other early discussions of the topic were provided by A. S. Osborne in his 1908 treatise, Typewriting as Evidence, and again in his 1929 textbook, Question Documents. A modern description of the examination procedure is laid out in ASTM Standard E2494-08, Standard Guide for Examination of Typewritten Items. Typewriter examination was used in the Leopold and Loeb and Alderhis cases. In the Eastern Bloc, typewriters, together with printing presses, copy machines, and later computer printers, were a controlled technology with secret police in charge of maintaining files of the typewriters and their owners. In the Soviet Union, the first department of each organization sent data on organization's typewriters to the KGB. This posed a significant risk for dissidents and surmised at authors. The ribbon can be read vertically, although only if it has not been typed over more than once. This can be very hard to do as it does not include spaces, but can be done giving even a typewriter a memory. Gallery 